So before beginning to talk about the coronavirus, let me start with a different story that will help to explain why is it that infectious diseases, especially those that have the capacity to spread throughout the world, are so concerning to us. So the story starts with a headline. And the headline is a simple headline. It says, two MERS patients die in South Korea. This is a, a screen capture from the CNN news webpage from June 2nd, 2015. And it's unusual because very rarely do you see headlines that say two people die, of, die in a place X. Why is among the largest news organizations in the world making a special case of the fact that two people have died of a disease in South Korea? Far, a number that's far larger than that typically die in Bangalore every day. So why was this important? It turns out that we do know a little bit more about what happened. And all of this started with one person, a 68-year-old South Korean man who was working in the Middle East. And he contracts a disease called MERS. So that's this gentleman's travel. He started off in Bahrain, moved to the UAE, moved back to Bahrain, moved to, moved at that point to UAE again, then went to Saudi Arabia, went to Qatar, and then finally returned to South Korea. He reached South Korea on the 4th of May. He fell ill by the 11th of May, 2015. After he fell ill, he was taken to hospital and infected a number of people, and those people are all listed here. They include his wife, the patient's wife shown in the, in the color there. They include a number of visitors that he had. They include a number of people who were visiting other people in the same ward in which he was confined. They include people who came there to meet somebody else, who went away, and then infected a whole bunch of other people. So you can all see this sort of expanding ring of people that a single person actually managed to infect. So we do know a lot about what happened in that particular context. The question is, why was so much trouble taken to figure this out? If you have been to hospital, it's very rare that people would come with a, with a, with a notebook to you and ask you, who did you meet, what were their names, what were their telephone numbers, write them all down starting from the last week. So in this particular case, in the case of this patient in South Korea, why was so much effort expended on trying to figure out who were the people that he interacted with before he died? So that goes to the question of why was MERS so special? Why is it advertised in the, in the CNN headline? And what makes some diseases different from some other diseases? So the reason is simple. It's that MERS is untreatable. There's no medicine and there's no vaccine for it. It's often fatal, as in the case of that particular patient. Patients die in days after being infected by it. It's transmitted from person to person. So it's an infectious disease with pandemic potential, which means it has a potential to spread across the world. It's interesting because MERS originated in Saudi Arabia. So this is the UN's list of cases. It starts in 2012 and goes on to 2019. You can see a bunch of peaks there. So this is week-wise, a week-wise count across the year. The little red spike that you see in the middle is the Korean spike. So that refers to the Korean person who was infected, infected a whole bunch of cases apart from himself. But the rest of them are really in Saudi Arabia and, and, and countries around it. This is important because Saudi Arabia sees a very large annual gathering of people. And this numbers in the several millions. And pilgrims to the Hajj come there and they go back to a very large number of countries, 188 countries. So when that happens, we must ensure that they don't carry back this disease with them. They don't carry back MERS with them. Okay? So this is not just as a worry for them. It's a worry for diseases in all that and all large gatherings of people where potentially you could transmit disease from one person to the other. That's our own version of a large gathering of people. And that's really why potential pandemics of incurable and possibly fatal diseases are taken so seriously. That's really the reason. So that's a nice example from MERS of exactly where the situation unfolded and what it is now is reflected in how seriously we take a disease like MERS and therefore a disease like the coronavirus. So what I'm going to do today is I will talk to you about a disease. It has an official name now as of the last 10 days. It's called COVID-19. COVID-19 is corona Coronavirus Infectious Disease 2019, which is pretty much the most unimaginative name that you can think of for a disease. This disease is caused by coronavirus. It was, the virus was earlier called 2019 novel coronavirus, so that's the NCOV. 
but it has an official name now. The official name now is SARS coronavirus 2. So for simplicity, we will refer to the SARS coronavirus 2 as simply the coronavirus, because that's a popular usage of the word, just in order not to confuse anyone. But you will see these terms, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, appearing increasingly in the papers. So what's an outbreak? An outbreak is simply a disease in some larger numbers that you expect in a community. In any given community, there's always some background of a certain number of cases, for example, of tuberculosis or malaria, etc. But if that number spikes by, let's say, a factor of 10, that's when one considers that this might be an outbreak. It exceeds normal numbers that you might see. An epidemic is an infectious disease that spreads rapidly to many people, but is still largely confined within a single region of the globe. Okay? So you can think of the coronavirus as it started off initially in China, in Wuhan province, as an epidemic in that particular region. A pandemic is when an epidemic becomes global. And the requirement for defining a pandemic is that you have sustained human-to-human -human transmission across multiple continents that are independent of how the case originally started. So even though a person of Chinese origin may have come there bearing the virus with them, how the virus propagates from person to person after that is now largely independent of how that case was initially seeded. That's once it spreads across the world, one then calls it a pandemic. So there are two examples that are important. The first is HIV AIDS, which we know from our own experiences, seeing it within our lifetimes. And the second is Spanish flu. And Spanish flu is particularly interesting. By the way, there will be this little image here is of is a Hollywood movie called Contagion. It's actually not a bad movie, which I can recommend. The major pandemic of the past century is Spanish flu. And so one needs to know a little bit more about it and how that might be related to the current epidemic. This is a type of influenza, and this is a picture of a ward, a large number of people. The Spanish flu was spread over approximately two years. It started in January 19, 19, 1918 and went on to December 1919. It infected about 500 million people around the world. So that's a number that's approximately 27% of the world population at that time. Around 30 to 50 million people died, and a large fraction of that was in India alone. So India was one of the worst hit by the Spanish flu, even though it's not really part of our collective memories anymore, even though it's now more, around 100 years since that actually happened. So that's a fairly large fraction of the then India population, about 5%. So that gives you some idea of what the spread of a disease like this might involve. The Spanish flu killed about 2.5% of its victims, which is in itself not a particularly large number. But because it infected so many people, medical care was cruder then, that the actual total number of deaths was actually fairly large. Okay, so there are two things. How many people does it infect? And what fraction of those people go on to die? The second reason that makes Spanish flu somewhat special is that it came at the end of the First World War. So already you had populations who had suffered through some years of, in many cases, soldiers who had suffered through five years of trench warfare, whose immune systems were already pretty badly off by that particular point. A population who had been suffering through malnutrition, through again many years, malnutrition, various types of stresses that are induced by wartime. So all of these added up to the effect of Spanish flu being more profound than it might have been at another time. So of all of the major epidemics of the past many decades, at least since 1920, none of them have been as serious or on the scale of Spanish flu. So here are these epidemics of the last 20 odd years. Okay? So that's SARS at the bottom, between 2002 and 2003. H1N1 in 2009, that's related to Spanish flu, so variant of Spanish flu. Then there's MERS in 2012, which we spoke about. There's Ebola, which is a different class of disease altogether, between 1976, 2013, 2014, 2019. And then there is the current coronavirus epidemic right at the top, 2019 onwards. That's the SARS-CoV-2. Hmm. You can see that the arrow keeps going on. It becomes a dotted line past the current time. That's because we expect that disease is a given of humankind. Infectious disease is also a given of the fact that we happen to be human. There will always be another disease around the corner. The only question being, how well do our public health systems and ourselves manage to cope with it? So this is, you can think of this as a timeline that expands. And as time goes on, you will fill this in with additional types of diseases. You will never get rid, rid of these diseases completely. And they will, but the ability to think about and deal with a particular disease epidemic gives you insights into how to deal with them as they recur at some later time as well. 
So of these, SARS, MERS, and the SARS-CoV-2, the current coronavirus, are all caused by the same type of virus. This is the coronavirus known because of its crown-like shape. And you can see the picture of the coronavirus on the right. That little, these little spiky things that come up are the crown. All of these diseases currently lack treatment or vaccines. So in a sense, they're all, once you get them, there is no way you can be treated other than just rest, allow your immune system to take over, and handle them as it only can. So a little bit for the people who've forgotten about some of these terms. What is a disease? What are the different types of disease? And what is a virus? And what does a virus do? So first of all, there's a broad classification of diseases into diseases that you can get from someone else or you can give someone else and diseases that you cannot transmit to other people. So infectious diseases are typically caused by some sort of microorganism. It's a bacterium or a virus or a parasite. Occasionally, there are a few more exotic ways in which you can have a disease that transmits from person to person, but this covers pretty much most of the situations. Non-infectious diseases come from genetic causes. They come from lifestyles. They come from various types of pollution and exposure that you might have. So here are some examples. H1N1 is a viral disease. Dengue is a viral disease. Malaria is a parasitic disease. The flu is a viral disease. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease. MERS is viral. SARS is viral. So that's just examples of diseases that you've seen or heard about and how they classify into the nature of the organism that actually causes it. In the right-hand column, for non-infectious diseases, you have diabetes, anemia, cancer, scurvy, arthritis, obesity, all of which are sort of characterized by the fact that you may be sitting next to someone who has diabetes or anemia, but you will never get it from them. Bacteria and viruses are somewhat different. You can see bacteria are large enough to see under the sort of microscope that you might use in a school or in a in, in lab. But viruses are much smaller, so usual microscopes won't do. You need very specialized microscopic techniques in order to see them. And here's again a picture of bacterium on the left-hand side and of uh, a virus with sort of pokey things on the outside on the right-hand side. Bacteria are very, very small living organisms. They multiply rapidly if you give them the right conditions to do that. It's your body's response to that multiplication, your immune system's response to that multiplication, that really gives you the feeling of being ill. It's just your immune system reacting and trying to get rid of the infection by these multiplying bacteria. So the, the, your body creates antibodies that attack these bacteria, and that's your response to an infection. Viruses are pretty useless on their own. They do none of this on their own. When they if infect humans or animals, they multiply inside the cells of those humans or animals, and then they burst them open in a process called lysis. Once they burst them open, they can go and attach onto other cells and do the same thing there. And this continuous infection of cells and the bursting open is what defines the viremia, or how a virus attacks a cell. Other important point is that antibiotics are useless against viruses. There are classes of antibiotics that are useful against specific types of bacteria. But you should never get into the impression of thinking that an antibiotic would be useful at all for you for a viral disease. This is important because all of us are used, or a good number of us are used to popping an antibiotic whenever we feel flu-like. Hmm? The flu is a classic influenza, which is virus spawn. And an antibiotic can do nothing for you. All it can do is to help make other types of bacteria a little more used to the presence of antibiotics and potentially lead to a condition called antimicrobial resistance, by which over a longer period you will generate bacteria that simply do not respond to the sort of antibiotics that you might have. This is a very serious point in modern medicine, that the increased number of, bac of, of antibiotics that are simply ineffective in dealing with a bacterial disease is on the rise. There are some very rare conditions for which there are just simply no bacteria. You're down to your last choice of, of, of antibiotic. So that is another question that's, it, that's unrelated to this particular talk, but that's something to keep in mind. So why aren't we constantly falling ill? That's because our immune system protects us. First of all, any prior contact with a virus or a piece of the virus is sufficient for our immune system to be provoked enough to build up its defenses against it. Once it does that, that's really what a vaccination does. A vaccination gets your immune system used to dealing or recognizing a particular piece of virus so that it can mount a defense against it. How do we get infected by viruses? First of all, bacteria and viruses move between humans and either directly or indirectly. So direct contact, shake someone's hand, wipe your face with it, that's one way of doing it. Indirect contact, someone touches the doorknob, you come back five minutes later and you touch it again, 
and then you move your hands to your face or your mouth or your nose, and that's enough to do it. Direct transfer through droplets, through someone sneezing is the third way. And once they're airborne, you can imagine that there could even be delay if someone sneezes. A little later, someone walks past and ingests some of the small particles that are emitted in that sneeze. And that's another way of doing it. And there are, of course, you, could, you can have waterborne diseases that are transmitted through water. There are multiple routes for getting them. But some diseases come to us through a somewhat circuitous route. They come through us from animals, for example, from bats or from poultry. So these viruses, or diseases which do that, are typically transmitted by viruses for whom those animals are a natural host. A natural host meaning that the animal is perfectly happy to have a certain number of these viruses circulating within it. It doesn't affect its, its own ability to function very critically. But the problem happens when these viruses that really belong to a different animal altogether make or jump or cross over or spill over onto the human species. This is the technical term for this is the spillover. And SARS, MERS, and the coronavirus are all examples of the spillover. They're all examples of viruses that began in an animal species, and somehow something happened that adapted them well to moving into the humans, and then they began to, influence the to infect the humans. Okay? And this is important, again, I'll come back to this point, because they don't, we are, they're not natural to our systems. We don't recognize them. Our immune system is, is a complete blank as far as they're concerned. And that's why they're particularly dangerous if they happen to be able to infect you. So let's go to this interesting story of the coronavirus outbreak as it is. So let me give you the timeline of what happened. So on December 31st in 2019, that's now about two months ago, the World Health Organization was informed of an outbreak of pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan city. Okay, Wuhan is the seventh largest city in China. And at 11 million residents, it's larger than Bangalore, it's larger than Chennai, it's larger than Hyderabad. It's kind of a little smaller than Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, etc. But that's the scale that we're talking about in terms of number of people. Already, hospitals in Wuhan city had been seeing a number of cases that they couldn't diagnose and they couldn't treat. These were cases that looked like pneumonia. These cases had sort of started by early December. There were some doubts about when they actually first came in, but they s gradually began to accumulate until someone finally suspected that there was something wrong with this whole situation. So finally, this was diagnosed as viral pneumonia. Pneumonia is typically bacterial in origin, but the fact that they could not isolate the bacteria responsible suggested that they had to look elsewhere. So they looked for a virus, and then the question was, which virus? was it that might lead to these particular symptoms. So the symptoms that the patients reported with were a combination of a dry cough, a fever, a shortness of breath, a runny nose, pneumonia in some cases, the more extreme cases. And you will recognize that these symptoms are all what you might call flu-like. If you have the flu or a cold, you have kind of similar symptoms to these, maybe not so extreme on this scale, but certainly at the milder scale, they're really hard to distinguish between the symptoms that these people were showing up with. Of course, these are different families of viruses. The viruses that cause a cold are very different from the viruses that cause the, this particular disease, the, the SARS-CoV-2. So the point is that you cannot identify the disease through the symptoms alone. That would have been convenient. If someone has jaundice, you can tell from the fact that they sort of turn yellowish. If they have uh, chicken pox, it's easy to tell, or measles, it's easy to tell. But for all of these diseases kind of look like influenzas, it's much harder to do. You, what you need is a lab test that identifies this particular virus as being different from the one that you have de dealt with earlier. When the sort of same procedures were employed, with these patients, as was done in the earlier case of MERS, of who did they contact, where did they go, where did they move around in, many of these patients turned out to have contacts with a seafood market called the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market in the center of the city. So that's a map of the city that shows you where the market is, where the airport is, and the Yangtze River that runs through. And this river is an important trade route for material to be transported from Wuhan City to the outside. So that's what the seafood market looked like after it was closed. This was January 21st, 2020. So let's again track through a little more carefully what happened, how exactly everything speeded up post January 31st. So on the 31st of January, the WHO was informed of the viral, of the viral pneumonia cases. By the 1st, which is one day later, they had closed the seafood market by identifying the connection between the market and the number of these cases. By the 3rd, the number of cases had gone up to 44, of which 11 were critical. And that's when the Wuhan Municipal Health Authority has made their first report, saying that there is something unusual going on here. We are seeing a cluster of cases that is possibly viral pneumonia. 
On the 7th or 8th is when the China CDC, the Center for Disease Control, reports that a novel coronavirus is involved and has been the causative agent in a fair fraction of the total number of cases that were detected up to that point. By the 10th of January, the first genome sequence of the pathogen, of the, of the virus, was actually made ready. So that's an extremely short timeline for most diseases. So that sort of indicates the level of attention and you know, the, the, the sheer resources that were put in by Chinese authorities to actually determine this. The 10th of January, so January is an interesting month for much of China because that's the time when the Chinese New Year begins. And by January 10th was the first year of the New Year migration. So that's the point at which large numbers of people had already begun to leave Wuhan, as well as the provinces embedded in, to other parts of China, as well as abroad. By January 13th, we were seeing the first set of cases outside China. The Thailand was the first. Outside Wuhan were the first cases in China, outside, uh, relating to different provinces. On January 20th, it was established that you could have the transfer of the disease between humans directly without the intervention of an animal. There were cases in Japan, South Korea. This just built up on the 21st of January from the US, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam. By the 23rd of January, Wuhan was under lockdown, so people were not allowed to leave the city anymore. The World Health Organization declared what's called a public health emergency of international concern, or a FEEC, on January 30th. So this was their third meeting, and the first two meetings ended inconclusively where they said that we can't quite decide whether this merits being called a FEEC or not. But that's, in the sense, the WHO's sort of topmost, a top line designation of the fact that countries around the world should begin to be concerned about this particular epidemic. The other FEECs you will recognize, certainly from, from your reading, the 2009 H1N1 swine flu, 2014 polio virus, 14 Ebola, Zika in 2015-16, which you will remember, and Ebola again in 2018-19, and 2020 is the last of that series of declarations. Technically speaking, the 2009 H1N1 swine flu was the only time that the WHO has declared a pandemic in recent years. After that, WHO strictly does not have a procedure, a formal procedure anymore, for declaring a pandemic. So while we may use the word pandemic, etc., that term is no longer officially used. And the WHO, by declaring something as a public health emergency of international concern, in a sense, what they're communicating is that this should be taken seriously by everybody. So this is as of, I think, today. There are more than 30 countries across which this, this disease is spread. The total number of cases is 82,000 odd. Of these, the deaths are around 2,800. The number recovered is around 33,000. And you can look at the different countries. You can scroll through the different countries in this. Mainland China, of course, has 98% 98 of the cases, as well as a, a large fraction of the deaths. South Korea now has the second largest number. The third largest number is, comes from a cruise ship that is, that is located off Japan at this point, which is effectively quarantined because people are not being allowed to come off. That includes a, a good fraction of Indians as well, typically people who were working on the ship at that point. Italy saw a very sharp rise in the number of cases over the last essentially four to five days. So it's now at 374. Iran joined again. So there you can see that now places like Singapore and Hong Kong which were initially reporting the cases that started off because they're most proximate to China and to Wuhan, now those numbers seem to have stabilized a little bit. And that's a sort of different story to each of these numbers. As I said, being so the timing of this was, this was such that a few million, million residents had already left Wuhan province before the city went into lockdown on January 23rd. Most of them went to within the province, and most international travelers went to Thailand, fair number of airports in Thailand, as well as to Singapore. And you can see in this color map how the virus actually spread in China between the 22nd of Jan, the 26th of Jan, the 3rd of Feb, the 9th of Feb, 15th of Feb, and now the 21st of Feb in terms of the colors. And the color coding is the number of cases that were actually seen. So this is the timeline of infections across different countries. So Thailand was the first to show an infection, then came Japan, then South Korea, then US and Taiwan. So the, the red circle, the red squares here, are when the first cases were detected. The black squares are where the first case of local transmission was actually detected. So you can see that it's expanded outward from the Chinese, initially to countries that surrounded or bordered or were physically close to China, Japan, South Korea, and then the US, which is a sort of long distance transmission, typically by someone who was taking a flight all the way from, from Wuhan city to an airport in the US. But let me tell you a little bit more about the coronaviruses and how they spread from animals to humans. There are actually seven human coronaviruses. 
Four of them are listed on the top. They have somewhat complicated names that don't really matter at the moment. But the three that are listed below are all ones that I've mentioned already, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, which is the current coronavirus. Infections with the first four typically follow a seasonal pattern like influenza. So they're fairly influenza-like, fairly cold-like in terms of their symptoms. It's interesting that the coronavirus is the second leading cause of the common cold, which is given by a virus called the rhinovirus. So about 10 to 15% of the time, you will think that you have a cold, but you're actually being, inf being infected by coronavirus and not the regular cold virus. Okay. Before SARS, that is before approximately the 2000s, no coronavirus ever caused a disease more serious than the common cold in human beings. And the coronaviruses of interest to us largely circulated among animals, camels, bats, and pigs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These coronaviruses can very rarely move between animal and people. Most infect a specific animal, for example, bats, but occasionally they evolve in order to be able to infect humans and to spread among people. So SARS came to human beings by civet cats. So all of these diseases tend to start among bats. Bats tend to be really prolific hosts for viruses. They move from bats to another animal, like for example, for SARS with a civet cat, and from civet cat to human beings. So that was the route that SARS took. For MERS, it was possibly bats in the beginning to camels, and from camels to human beings. For the coronavirus, it's not completely clear, but the most plausible route right now is from bats to pangolins to human beings. So you can see the sort of spread through some intermediate exotic animal. And that will be of some importance as, we, as I explain a little later where this might have actually originated from. So what about the coronavirus and where did it come from and how is it spreading? So if you remember early on, we said that all of these patients, or a good fraction of these patients, had come into contact with this Wuhan seafood and live animal market. And that suggested that there was some animal to human transmission actually going on, from some animal in the market to a human. But later, of course, person to person spread to COVID, where there was no animal connection at all. It's just that two people, one person was ill, they met somewhere else, and then finally it turned out that both of them fell ill. So that suggested very likely that it was an airborne transmission. Possibly a possibility has been raised more recently that even toilets and a sort of, uh, a sort of fecal route to transmission might also be the case. So if you think of the seafood market in Wuhan as the origin of the outbreak, it's interesting to ask the question of you know, why the seafood market? So the seafood market in Wuhan is what's called a wet market. And the name wet comes from the fact that large quantities of water are used to swill the, the, the ground wet, especially those floors in which live animals are sold. And I will explain why this is of significance a little later. But right now, the current understanding is that the connection with the market is not completely, not completely clear at the moment. Whether it was a human being who was infected from somewhere, who came to the market, infected people in the market, and then they sort of it exploded from there, or whether there was an animal actually involved in the market, is currently not completely clear. But that story will no doubt be clearer as we go along. So what are the questions we can ask about an epidemic? So here are the sort of questions that you can ask. Suppose you start from a few infected people, these 20-odd cases that turned up in the hospital in Wuhan. Will the disease spread or will it not spread? That's certainly the most important question to ask. The second question to ask is, if it spreads, how many people will be infected? What are the numbers that we're looking at? Are we looking at 1,000 people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people, 10 million people, or 100 million people? Can vaccines help? Is there, can we devise a vaccine for the disease fast enough that we can protect people who have not been exposed to it? The answers to all of these questions depend essentially on one quantity. It has a technical name. It's called the basic reproductive ratio, and that differs from disease to disease. So this is the one epidemiological term that I will use and describe to you because it actually is a very important concept in the field of epidemiology. It has a very simple interpretation. And that interpretation is just the following. If I start with one infected person and I place them in a background of lots of people who are susceptible to the disease, on average, how many people does that single infected person infect? OK? That's the number. So the examples given here will tell you that for Ebola, the average is two. On average, one Ebola patient will infect two people. For swine flu, H1N1, on average, one patient will infect two people. For HIV, that number becomes four. For smallpox, that number is seven. For measles, that number is 18. 
So measles is very highly transmissible between people. If none of you have had your measles vaccines and I bring one measles patient into the room, likelihood is at the end of this lecture, after this, you've ensured that this patient is sort of circulating enough around you, that a good fraction of you will have already got that disease. So measles is highly transmissible, which is one reason why certainly immunization against measles is a very important part of how we prepare our immune systems when we're very young. For the coronavirus, this is believed to be somewhere between two and three. From some aspects, this is good. From some aspects, it is bad. It's certainly not as bad as in 18. But on the other hand, it could have been smaller, ideally. This indicates that roughly for every person who's infected, they will infect somewhere between two and three people. Two people some of the time, three people some of the time. And that's enough to give it this epidemic character, this ability to spread. Because one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32. And you can see how this number expands exponentially as you go on in time. What we know now about the disease is that roughly 80% of people have fairly mild illness. About 14% after that have some sort of severe disease. And a smaller 5% have, can become critical if, if infected with this. And by critical, I mean respiratory failure, septic shock, organ failure, et cetera, et cetera. So there are people who are very ill, but it's only 2%, roughly speaking, from what we know at this time, for whom the virus is fatal. If you look at who it affects, that's an interesting statistic that came out from the WHO recently. This disease affects older people much more than it does younger people. And it affects people with pre-existing conditions much more than it affects people without them. So beyond, if you look at 80 plus years, the death rate is around 15% for them. If you look at 10 to 19 years, it's about 0.2%. And if you look at the zero to nine years, there are no fatalities at all. So certainly age, increased age predisposes you to sort of falling, to, to, to be falling prey to the virus. Not only that, any type of pre-existing condition such as di diabetes or cardiovascular disease, also predisposes you to falling prey to it. So if you conclude from this is that older people are people who should specially watch out and who healthcare system should speci specifically be gauged to treat carefully when they appear with the, the symptoms of the disease. Certainly those are pre-existing conditions. Children and young adults seem to recover fairly well and system symptoms can be mild. And this is very interesting because for many cases there may be people who really think that they just had a mild cold and it's very irritating and I won't go to office for two days. And after that, recover. And it turns out they have been infected by the coronavirus only because they weren't tested or the symptoms weren't strong enough for them to manifest any noticeable complication that they managed to survive through it. So let's just compare numbers here of, of this with other recent epidemics. So that's the disease on the left is the COVID-19. That's the coronavirus on the left. Compare that to SARS, MERS, and Ebola. So the large square outside, the large reddish looking square, is the total number of cases. So this is as of a few days ago. And the deaths is, a, is that small little black chunk that you see at the corner. So you can see immediately that in comparison to all of these, to MERS, to SARS, Ebola, and COVID, there are many, many more cases. And that's the sort of numbers that we were looking at. But if you look at the size of the small square as a fraction of the larger square, you can see that the fatality rate is not all that high. It's somewhere between 2 and 3, 2.9 in this particular picture. But for SARS, for example, it was 10%. For, uh, for MERS, it was 35%. So 35% of the bigger square is occupied by those black little chunks that you see there. And for Ebola, the fatality rate is around 44 to 45%. So the fatality rates are small. Numbers of cases are large. And therefore, total number of deaths are large. That's the way you should read these particular numbers here. And that's interesting because now you realize that this disease has already crossed sort of bounds that we knew for all of these other coronavirus diseases that we are familiar with, and diseases that have actually struck humankind in this century. So SARS killed about 800 uh, of the approximately 8,000 people who fell ill in 29 different countries. MERS was more deadly. We saw the, 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 the rises and the falls in these cases. But, you know, it was really confined to Saudi Arabia and a couple of other countries in its near neighborhood. The coronavirus is, in a sense, most extensively similar to, to the SARS virus in terms of its structure and the way it seems to infect people. So what are the public health measures that one can, one should take? The most fundamental public health measure is, is, very can, is just sort of simply summarized in one line, that you have to break the chain of transmission that takes the virus from person to person. There are many ways of doing this, but certainly the first way is just quarantine sick people and test them rapidly. If you 
test them fast and they don't have the disease, you're able to release them because then you can take them out of a medical situation that might involve access or contact with other types of patients who, could, who were equally ill, possibly even ill with the same disease. You need to track contacts. Who did this person who was ill, who did they interact with, who did they meet, who did they have close physical contact with, and you need to test them as well to check whether they have got the disease. You need to restrict movement. The more you allow people to go out into the community and interact with each other, the more you allow for disease to be transmitted from one person to the other. For those who are infected, you need to provide supportive treatment. There is not much you can do because there is no drug, there is no vaccine, there is nothing at this stage, but you have to make sure that their immune systems are fueled as carefully as you can and that nothing worse happens to them, at least f f to what extent it's within your power to, to control. And the last point is devise tests, vaccines, and drugs very quickly for diseases like this. There are, of course, larger issues. And one is you need infrastructure to deal with many patients. You need diagnostic tools. You need the ability to quarantine large populations. And there's some argument that early stages of the Chinese response were limited by the fact that they were essentially scrambling to create the right sort of quarantining, to, to find out whether the tests were working or not, et cetera, et cetera, in the beginning. So that's the sort of now the test that you might see if you, if you uh, if you pass through airports. Right now, airports have thermal scanners to detect people who have elevated temperatures. And if you do, then they will take you out. They will ask you questions about your history. That's an example of a set of hospital beds inside in, in, in the Chinese hospital. You have a bunch of patients lying next to each other. This, of course, you may have seen. This is the large 1,000-bed hospital that the Chinese made essentially in 10 days, which is really quite a feat of, 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 of engineering and architecture to make a hospital from scratch, in a thousand bed hospital from scratch in, in, in exactly 10 days. I want to talk about a bunch of topics. We've been doing very gloomy things from so far, but I want to talk about disease from other contexts, not just about people falling ill, but what are the larger implications of an infectious disease, of a pandemic, of an epidemic of disease? So I've chosen a bunch of topics, so let me just go through them one by one. The first is the ethics of names. So H1N1 disease was dubbed swine flu because the initial input that it came from pigs to human beings. An unfortunate offshoot of this particular name was that Egypt slaughtered all its pigs, even though the disease was spread from human to human and not from pigs, apart from that initial mode of transmission. Why not just call it the Wuhan coronavirus? That would have made sense. That's where it started from. When we think of the disease spreading, we think of Wuhan as the epicenter of how the disease spread. The reason is that identifying a disease by the place of origin harms the people who live there. Tourists withdraw. They don't want to go there anymore. For the next 50 years, people will only think of Wuhan as a place where the disease started out. And investment cools as a consequence. So linking a disease with a specific place leads to discrimination and to stigmatization of the population that comes from there. So that's the reason for the name COVID-19. As I said, it's a very boring name. But the WHO had to tread this very difficult intermediate path. They had to find a name that did not refer to a geographical location, an animal, or an individual, or a group of people. And that was also easy to pronounce. Because this name needs to be, able, you need to be able to pronounce it by people who are used to speaking Spanish, or Mandarin, or French, or Norwegian, or a bunch of languages around the earth. The name has to be compact enough, as well as pronounceable. It's interesting that the World Health Organization names the disease, but the virus is named by, some, by a completely different organization, in this case, the Coronavirus Study Group of the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. So what they did was decide that the virus was a variant to the SARS coronavirus, and so therefore they named it SARS coronavirus, SARS-related coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. Okay. That sort of seems logical, except that from the point of view of communicating risk to people, especially to the general population. The use of the word SARS can have un unintended consequences. They create fear for some, given that many populations, especially in South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, remember the SARS epidemic. Calling something SARS-2, you know, as, as the usual naming of, of movie sequels, is, is, uh, is probably a mistake. That's what the WHO said. And certainly China has resisted comparisons between the current crisis and the earlier SARS crisis. So people have made this point that the different name is needed for the new coronavirus. That's a, a group of Chinese scientists have made this particular statement. But it's yet to be changed, and it may just stick. Uh, 
Let's talk about civil liberties under epidemics. So currently, the total population of Chinese cities under lockdown is around 60 million. That is more than the population of Australia or Canada. And this lockdown has now exceeded a month. So that's a long time to keep a population under lockdown. So if you ask about the legitimacy of this from a sort of human rights or policy point of view, the WHO is fairly unambiguous in saying that interference with freedom of movement when instituting quarantine or isolation for a communicable disease may be necessary for the public good and could be considered legitimate under international human rights law. Okay, and that is a sense is something that, that, that seems reasonable, that your disease is not just your disease alone. It potentially influences the human rights of other people. On average, citizens tend to accept measures that, in, that influence or impinge upon their civil liberties if they feel it's for the greater good, if everyone suffers equally, and an end is in sight. Roughly speaking, these are good guidelines to keep in mind. So one analogy, a political analogy might be demonetization, which you could argue was perceived as fulfilling these three points. But roughly speaking, the, the fact that populations can accept or can, can take on the feeling that you know, we can get through this is certainly motivated by points of this type. So Chinese citizens are, however, under strain. So this is, I don't know when we will go out again. Chinese citizens trapped at home by coronavirus feel the strain. Every day there's fighting, every day we sigh, every day I'm scolded, says teenager who has been unable to leave a grandmother's apartment for weeks. Anyone who has brought up a teenager, their sympathies will be completely with the grandparent in this particular case. And, uh, but you can sort of realize that it, it is difficult to confine people for any length of time, whatever their ages might be. Because the other point is that measures like this create a sort of antagonistic relationship between citizens and government. It also makes disease tracking more difficult because people who violate this are automatically under pressure not to reveal the fact that they have violated a quarantine, that they have managed to skip out here, that they've gone to visit their neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other serious point is that if you suffer from other diseases, you might be denied proper care because you're now confined, you're told not to move out, but you do have a condition that needs medical attention. It may not be the coronavirus, it might be something else, but you do need to be able to access hospitals as easily as you might have been otherwise. And even in Singapore, which is fairly rigorous about how it implements these rules, you, you, as, they, as, as the Straits Times points out, more employers and employees have been caught breaching the leave of absence rules because employees were instructed to tell their employees to stay at home, not come to work, work out of home. Here's another sort of feature that is specific to China. To some extent, it may apply to other countries as well. China currently imprisons or is believed to imprison a large fraction of its population, of its Muslim population, Uyghur Muslims, in essentially what are detention camps. The number is about one million. The estimated number is about one million odd. If you think about epidemics of disease in a tightly confined population under detention, that's a situation that is really ripe for problems. And that's certainly another issue where human rights intersects infectious disease in a very true and, 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 and a very deep and delicate way. Let's talk about the human-animal interface here. So as I pointed out, all of the major diseases, we talked about MERS, we talked about SARS, we talked about the coronavirus, three out of four, typically of every new emerging infectious disease, comes from animals to human beings. They're called zoonotic diseases. The Wuhan seafood market, where, which potentially started all of this off, was a market where large numbers of exotic wild animals were kept under unhygienic and crowded conditions. The larger context in which this happens is the craze for finding exotic sources of meat, exotic animals to keep at home, etc., implies the destruction of wild habitats. The consumption of exotic animals is, again, has cultural connotations, which we'll talk about a little bit here. But the other more sort of economic consequence is a flourishing trade in wild animals, again, which is an economic root of why, again, many of the diseases have begun to spread. So at the Wuhan seafood market, there were a bunch of exotic animals, live foxes, crocodiles, wolf puppies, peacocks, porcupines, camel meat, etc., that were available. And the reason of the, the wet market comes in is because you mix fluids between living creatures and creatures that have been freshly slaughtered together. 
And this is pretty much ripe, perfect conditions for a virus to flourish. And especially once you bring in close human contact together with these in terms of cutting animals to get open up together, that really, I mean, any, you don't have to be a serious virologist to sort of sense that these are situations that are ripe for diseases to be transmitted. Much of, of, of the trade in, in international trade and legal trade in wildlife is driven by demand from China. And as I pointed out, this leads to extensive cross-exposure of species and populations which would not mix otherwise in the wild. It's unlikely that you or I, even if we were in China, would encounter a wild pangolin, at least at close enough quarters for that encounter to be significant enough for any disease to be transmitted. To its credit, China has taken steps, immediate steps to, to prevent this trade. So China is set to clamp down permanently on the wildlife trade in the wake of the coronavirus. And this is something that, that wildlife conservationists have been saying for a while. But now there's a disease angle to it. In the earlier part was a conservation angle. Now there's, in addition, this sort of worry about diseases that come to us from animal sources. It's just that the scale of, of, of the trade has been, has surprised some people. The, the hitherto unknown size of the industry, as this particular quotation points out, has wasn't anticipated earlier. The third aspect of pandemics, again, I'm sort of expanding on these as a general way of thinking about pandemic disease in a much broader context, apart from the fact that people fall ill, people fall die. And the fact that there are many parts of, of society, social life, interactions that really impinge upon how we think about disease. So with this CNN title, old, a new virus stirs up ancient hatred in this particular quotation. But across the internet, we've seen widespread eruptions of racist scapegoating. The posts frequently claim or imply that the epidemic is the result of Chinese eating habits and hygiene, while saying that Chinese eat anything and everything and infect the world with viruses, calling Chinese a dirty people who can't keep order, and warning people to think twice before ordering anything Chinese. Okay. So that's one set of here. What about geopolitics and economics? Wuhan, as I pointed out, the city of 11 million people, is also a very important e-commerce and shipping hub. It's part of supply chains like Apple. So there's a concern that the latest iPhone may be delayed or because of the absence of parts coming from Wuhan. It's important pharmaceutical supply chains. They supply active pharmaceutical ingredients to many countries, including India. So much of what goes into the medicines that you buy in pharmaceutical shops here originates in materials that are bought in China. So the questions of how these, su these supply chains are going to be maintained in the presence of a coronavirus is an important question to worry about. Domestic industry certainly will suffer if you quarantine people because they just can't go to work. Travel and tourism, Chinese are huge travelers out of China. And so the collapse of Chinese travel outside of, of China is, has far-reaching consequences for airlines for example, for Cathay Pacific, for all of its whole bunch of Chinese airlines, for Singapore Airlines, et cetera, et cetera, all of which used to run very, very busy routes between many airports in China to many other airports in Southeast Asia. That's a picture of what it looked like before the flight cancellation. That's a snapshot of the number of planes in the sky, both before and after. So before was 12,814 flights within China that dropped to 1,662 flights within China between Jan 23rd and Feb 13th. The number of flights have plummeted, the number of domestic flights have plummeted by a factor of 80% or more. For people who are concerned about broader issues of, of, of what this will do to economics, you can find headlines that predict pretty much all sorts of terrible things. The virus hit shipping, spreading global economic strain, oil prices slip, China car, China car sales slumped 92% in February. That's a huge jump. What about climate change and sustainability? And this is something that interests the institution I come from, Ashoka University. The first thing is there's been a noticeable decline, and this is a positive, in, in greenhouse gas emissions and pollution, just from the fact that there is no industrial activity and, and much reduced automobile use. So if you look at nitrogen dioxide levels across China between what it used to be in the January of the previous year and the current year, there's a huge difference that you can see. And this is an unexpected positive in terms of global climate, but of course it will not last the moment that the economy is back on its rails and manufacturing begins again, it will go back to what it used to be. The other point is a subtler point. It's the fact that the world is so hyper-connected nowadays that you can fly from Delhi to Chicago in one hop or to, or to Wuhan or to Hong Kong or to Singapore, etc. means that a person who falls ill in Hong Kong today can be in Singapore tomorrow and can be in Seoul day after and can be in Melbourne the third day. So it's this hyper-connectedness of the world that is absent 
in, 1880, in 1918, 1919 during the Spanish flu that has contributed to how fast this disease has actually spread across the world. And now, as I said, 30 countries in pretty much since December 31st. So December 31st to now February 27th in a period of little less than, a slightly less than two months, it has now pretty much crossed across the world. It's gone to South America. Brazil reported a case recently. Europe, North America, Australia, the Far East, parts of China, and Russia. The same hyperconnectedness is also responsible, is also contributed to climate change. So when I teach climate change at Ashoka University as part of the course that I do, it's often a question of, well, you can think of this as it, there's nothing that we can do, the world is going to hell, we're all going to, we're all going to die, etc., etc. Or you can ask yourself, what, to what level can in, an individual contribute to, to, to the situation? Mm -hmm. The simplest thing that any individual can do is just simply travel less by air. And uh, that would be, at the individual level, what you can actually do. If you can fly directly, fly directly, don't fly by a hop, even though it costs more. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to recognize the sort of sense of ineffectiveness that one feels in the face of the really what could potentially be a global calamity that affects all of us. And the difficulty of finding something that one can do that might help to contribute to, to something positive in that respect. How should you personally stay protected and what should you do? And let me just clarify that the chances at this point that you will contract the novel coronavirus is pretty much minimal, given that the number of cases in India is right now zero because all the people who have been quarantined earlier have been declared now free of the disease. But I suggest that you look at the WHO pages for up-to-date instructions. But the first, exa first point is to wash your hands very regularly. And if I had the right sort of demonstration equipment, I would actually have shown you on this to sort of make the demonstration a whole lot more graphic at this point. Prepare, practice respiratory hygiene, that is do not sneeze into the open. Sneeze into your elbow as a sort of, as what is now, now usually taught to students in, in, in North America, rather than sneeze into your hands. Maintain social distancing, that is do not try to avoid large groups of people that are packed fairly close together. Avoid touching your, your eyes, nose and mouth. So, you know, do not do this and then do this. That's again a spot thing. And seek medical help if you have any doubt, especially if you have difficult bre difficulty breathing, that's the time to go and see a doctor. So now the question, of course, that I'm sure is on all your minds is what happens next? And every day one sees one more scary headline. This is a scary headline in red for from a two days ago. The Austria and Croatia report first cases, Tenerife quantized. A whole hotel of over 1,000 people has now been quarantined in Tenerife. So let me just make a couple of arguments to you. I want to give you a little bit of background. So let's first talk about influenza. So influenza, the, which is what we know as the flu, it spreads around the world in yearly outbreaks and typically results in about three to five million cases across the world. And that's already, that's at about five to 50% of the world population, depending upon where you pick that number. As a consequence of this, there are about 300,000 to 600,000 deaths annually. And these deaths typically happen in older people. There is a vaccination. You can be, there's a f yearly flu vaccine that you can have. This is usually administered to older people in North America. I don't know about its effectiveness here, but usually the deaths come for older people or people whose immunity is somehow compromised. For the coronavirus, the fatality rate is around 2%. But if you look outside the province where it started, which is Hubei province, that number drops to about 0.05%. This lower number is not too far from the mortality that you see with seasonal influenza. Compare this to the SARS death rate, or fatality rate, which is more than 10%. So the question is, what number should you believe? What is the appropriate number in this particular case? So you might argue that in terms of its impact, in terms of that particular number that I showed you, this, this disease, COVID-19, is somewhat less mild than seasonal influenza, but still nowhere on the scale of SARS. Seasonal influenza has a mortality rate well below 1%, but it still causes 600,000 deaths globally because it spreads to so many people. The good parts of it is that it infects younger people, but they recover. Babies seem surprisingly immune. But deaths are largely in older people and those with compromised immunity. However, they're already at risk from influenza. So the same sort of precautions that you would take with influenza would apply in this particular case as well. So let me describe a bunch of scenarios to you. One is an optimistic scenario, and that says COVID-19 remains, so that's a coronavirus disease, remains mostly confined to China. 
now that seems un increasingly unlikely. This is a slide that was prepared about two weeks ago when it sort of seemed possible that we were over the hill, that things could actually be held in check. If no other country sees sustained transmission, the risk of spread should go down. Again, that is unlikely now, given what we've seen about the increased numbers of cases in Italy, in Iran, and in South Korea. These are the three countries where the number of cases have suddenly rocketed. It seems to be that things seem to be not particularly tending towards this thing damping down, but to ramping up, at least in those countries, even though in China we seem to be over the, over the hill. So the scenario of it going away was a scenario that was applicable to SARS in 2003, which ended after fewer than about 9,000 cases. A lot depends upon what happens with summer. Typically, seasonal influenza in temperate climates is mainly, is very seasonal, typically in the, in the winter months. And sunlight, temperature, humidity are not particularly good for virus spread. That's the thinking. If it follows the same path that SARS or MERS as we get warm, as we get into warmer climates, there's a possibility that th the ability to spread will be somewhat muted, and that could certainly be a good thing. There's a pessimistic scenario, and that is it's too late now to contain the virus, and there is sustained human transmission outside of China, for example, in Italy, Iran, and South Korea. Therefore, this is something that humanity may need to adjust to, rather than assume that everything is going to go away and we're all going to be fine. There's an in-between scenario which says that, look, there are already four circulating coronaviruses. They typically give you something like the common cold. Maybe this will mutate into something that is again like those. So instead of four, we will have five. They will come back seasonally. They will affect you, a small fraction of people who are most susceptible and more to in terms of disease will be affected by this. But otherwise, it is pretty much indistinguishable from an influenza at this point. A bunch of people have now sort of weighed in on both sides of the debate. So they had sort of to the director of the US CDC, the Center of Disease Control has said, I think this virus is probably with us beyond the season, beyond this year. And Lipsitch at, at Harvard has said, I think it's likely we will see a global pandemic. And you can see the lower line, it says Saudi Arabia bars pilgrims as virus cases spread. And earlier they were sort of trying to prevent people from going out with the disease, now they're trying to people uh, with another disease, now they're trying to prevent people coming in with this particular disease. This question of what happens if it becomes, it, if it achieves the pandemic status is, first of all, it's a question of communication. How do you prepare the public for thinking about this? What is the sort of messaging that you need to transfer to them? And what will happen? This is very hard to predict in terms of, because we have no real experience of, of what might happen in this particular case. In particular, in India, we have no, no real experience of what might happen in the face of a potential pandemic. All we can tell people is that the sort of precautions that you might need to take in terms of social distancing, washing hands, taking care that elderly people uh, receive appropriate medical attention, and preparedness in terms of being able to quarantine people, in terms of being able to treat them, respirators in hospitals, personal protective equipment, stockpiling these. All of these are things that one hopes that governments are prepared to think about. And saying that this is not going to happen, it's all going to be rosy, we're all going to be very happy after this, is probably, uh, I mean, one can potentially now begin to question that strategy and say that maybe we should readjust to a world where we have, we have to account for this somewhat more serious possibility. To strengthen capacity in India is actually vital. So I can, I can direct you to this nice article by Priyanka Pulla and The Wire that concentrates on what has happened in the, in, in the Manipal um, research facility that looks at viruses. And it's now being somewhat stressed by government which has withdraw, withdrawn research funding from it, both, and also prevented it from raising its funding from the outside. This is a particularly bad thing to do at this stage. So the only comment that I make is that dealing with pandemics of the sort needs more than ever before international cooperation, wise administration, and sensible non-paranoid governance. You, to, to say that, look, it's all a US imperialist plot to get Indians sick and biological warfare, et cetera, is just not sensible anymore in terms of what we know about this disease. And the fact that you do need international collaboration at a fundamental and a deep level to be able to solve problems that are truly international. So let me sum up. I want to make one point which I hope that despite the somewhat gloomy nature of the subject, you have I've managed to communicate. And that is that there's no other more interdisciplinary field than the study of infectious disease epidemics. 
You have to think about virology, epidemiology, medicine, public health, mathematical modeling, economics, ethics, trade, sociology, and geopolitics, and this is an incomplete list. All of these, I hope that what I was able to point out in terms of these many different contexts is the fact that this is a problem with so many facets and shapes that you can, much like the elephant and the blind men who are sort of pulling it at different, and sort of investigating different parts of it, you will find something in it to fascinate you if you're an academic like myself, or even if you're not, not an academic, but someone just interested in the functioning of the world around you. The second part of my summing up is that if you sort of look at the people on the front line, involved in this. Tackling epidemic diseases really relies on the selflessness of many people. It relies on, for example, that picture at the bottom there is a child being immunized in the Northwest Frontier Province, where people who go out for vaccination campaigns run the genuine risk of being shot to death. That is the doctor on the top right hand side, that is the doctor who died, who was the head of the hospital where the coronavirus uh, patients first came to. The picture there is the Nipah, is, is health workers all suited and, and protected, carrying a body for burial. Wuhan doctors have been beaten up, overworked, undersupplied. The, the Chinese Health Commission says that over 3,000 medical staff have been infected. So these are people who are really, in a very little sense, taking their lives into their hand to ensure that the world is a better place and a happier, safer place to live in. So I think of these people as the real heroes of our time people who are prepared to be on the front lines of tackling a disease epidemic, one in which they could potentially lose their lives. In, these are people that you and I will not hear of. We don't know their names unless it's, for example, with the doctors of who, who would head the hospital. His name is published in a paper. But there is really a lot of selflessness behind this that I think we would do well to appreciate. So with that, let me sort of stop and thank all of you for coming and listening. Thank you so much. I think this was a fascinating talk. And uh, let me begin. I think, let's see. I have a few questions, but I'll hold them to see what audience questions there are first, because I'm sure there would be many. And I don't want to take up audience time. I can. So any questions? Yes. I think there's a lot of work, multiple labs in the country, but vaccine development is usually a slow process. And the typical time scales are six months to a year at best. Usually the problem with many of these things is that once the epidemic peaks and goes away, interest in developing a vaccine also peaks and goes away. And the secret is to sort of time it right so that you can get a vaccine in place. There have been some reports from Singapore of, of, uh, of one, where there's a couple of reports of things in preparation, drugs that seem to work, etc. But it's all preliminary at the moment. And usually, the time scales for vaccines tend to be somewhat longer. <coughs> we don't know yet. Hello. Uh, oh, uh, thank you very much for a, actually a very fascinating lecture. You keep reading bits and pieces in the newspapers, but to put it all together like this was fantastic. Thank you. I have one question, because that's an area uh, which has troubled some of us, and I don't want to sound this as rumor-mongering or creating panic. But being Yuhan, there was an early feeling that it could have been biological tests gone wrong. Any comments on that? So I think that particular point is now ruled out. There certainly was a lot of sort of fear, fear around that, that maybe this was Wuhan houses a, bio, bio, a BSL lab for, which is, does virus testing, et cetera. But I think now on the basis of genetic information, that's conclusively ruled out. That this is not engineered. It comes naturally via bats and intermediate animals to human beings. So why don't we get these diseases directly from bats? Why do we need an intermediate animal? That's a good question. I suspect it's because direct contact with bats is relatively rare. There are only sort of small communities, typically tribal communities, that directly go to bat caves, collect bat droppings, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be some level of immunity already to the viruses that are there. It's really sort of bat to intermediate animal, to wet market, to close proximity with human beings. That seems to be critical. And it's possible that some sort of reassortment of the virus in that intermediate animal host may also help to promote this. But that's a good question. I'm not sure why that, why I, my, that would be my guess. I don't know if there's a better answer than that. 
you said, it affects older people uh, and people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, do you mean conditions that are like bacterial or viral, or does it include genetic conditions too? So by pre-existing, the ones that I listed were something like cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, certainly. So various types of metabolic diseases are all what would be counted as pre-existing in that particular. Certainly if your immunity is, is, is reduced by exposure to something else, if you have some coexisting infection along with that, certainly that would also count. So if your immunity is reduced for any reason, then you tend to fall more easier prey to the virus. Surprisingly immune to COVID-19. Uh, one would expect otherwise, right? Like I mean, children have uh, limited exposure to various infections, so immunity would be, I think, lesser compared to a full-grown adult. So there's, again, there's a lot about these diseases that we don't understand. Okay. So that again, this is going by these numbers. So that it is possible that in this particular set of patients that they study, the numbers are not large enough to bring out cases. Maybe the Maybe the kids fell ill, but they recovered faster. So, I mean, it, it, it's right now it's sort of hard to draw very strong conclusions, apart from the fact that elderly people beyond the age of 70 or 80 tend to, tend to fall, to, to, tend to be more susceptible to more extreme forms of, of the disease. Okay. And I that younger people are affected more mildly. So I have a question which is follow up from uh, Rama's question. So uh, you said we need a... Um, intermediate uh, host animal. So uh, not in case of COVID, but like SARS and MERS or other uh, more studied viruses, like is there any evidence that people have seen that the virus goes, uh, undergoes some genetic restructuring in the process of when it is? Yeah, uh, so, so for example, um, I think H1N1 in, in 2009 is a sort of complicated assortment of swine and human and sort of across different continents. So there's a, it, there's a Mexican component to it, there's a Chinese, comp Chinese, European component to it. So there's been multiple stages of reassortment that have actually happened. And that's it's a bit of a miracle of modern science that you can actually trace these events and come to conclusions about them. Yeah, some years ago, we had the Nipah virus, and they also traced it to bats. Has it gone off the radar, or was it analyzed well? So right now, as I know, there are no cases reported in India. Again, that seems to have been a case of you know few cases there, rapidly I, rapid isolation, good public health procedures, made sure that it didn't, didn't go any further. And so currently, that is not a problem here. Yeah. Uh, so currently, that is not a problem on this case. You mentioned uh, uh, warmer climates, uh, colder climates. And as we get into summer, there's a lesser chance of this thing spreading. Uh, we live in a warmer country. Uh, are we better off here? Well, I would certainly hope so. But um, it, so, my, so I'm, not, I'm not really a virologist, so I can just tell you what, 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 roughly what I understand. It's in temperate regions that you have the strong seasonality. In the more equatorial regions, it tends to be somewhat irregular in terms of its, of, of its ability. It's not, there's no clearly defined seasonality, in, in, for example, in influenza. I would, so the impression of some of the virologists that I've had is that temperature will be important. The sort of dryness that you get in summer will be important. And that's one reason for preferring a more optimistic outlook. And certainly, the world would be a lot happier if that were the case. Right now, it's not possible to tell. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, hi, Gautam. Um, I'm here. Thanks for a fabulous presentation. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, do uh, wanted you to come and do a bit of future gazing and comment on, you know, how well prepared is India's uh, public health system to cope with something if it were if we were to have a breakout. Um, I mean, in the past, Nipah. I mean, you know, state governments have done well uh, when the public health systems within the state have been good and they've been able to kind of contain it. Um, uh, but uh, given the history, uh, country history, if you can throw some light on, you know, look at look back at how the country country level it is dealt with other epidemics, and how would we if how are we prepared and what should worry us and what should give us confidence? Okay, that's a sort of hard question to answer <laughs> in, in 
So my feeling is that we have dealt with NEPA, for example, where the number of cases were small, effectively. Mm -hmm. They did a good job of quarantining, ensuring that it didn't spread. My worry is with the sort of numbers that Wuhan was seeing. If we get the level of the number of cases that require treatment, and even the Chinese system pretty much managed to deal with it at tremendous cost of, in terms of, of health workers who were exposed, of people on the front line. Of, I mean, their systems were really creaking at the seams. So I would sort of doubt our ability to deal with numbers like that. And plus, with China, you have the whole, the benefit of having a strong state with essentially single party rule, the ability to do things that conventional democracies can't. And, and you know, to be able to lock up 60 million people, to confine them to a region for a month, is something that I find would be very hard, at least in my opinion, that would be very hard to do in India. So for me, the, an the, the answers to the, that particular question would really depend upon numbers. I would think we would do a reasonable job of dealing if the numbers are small. If the numbers are larger, it would certainly strain our resources considerably. I have I have a uh, couple of questions. The first question uh, sorry, is sorry. Could I ask you to yeah. keep it to one because there are a lot of people and we okay, have only no, ten minutes. My first question is answer will be very small only. <laughs> yeah. the, the first question, one question is please. the quest, first question is. You know, uh, seeing the connectivity between viruses and animals, can you make a statement that it is better to be a vegetarian rather than a non-vegetarian? Mm -hmm. So that intersects cultural issues. And as I said, even, I mean, the point of my talk was you should, not, you should look at infectious disease and pandemics really as a mirror to see many, many different issues and the way, you th way one ought to think about them. Food is very cultural. And so there can be no uniform statement can be made saying that, look, abandon that part of your culture because it might have X, 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 Y, or Z positives in some other region. And the second one, the... I'm sorry, in, in we have to move to another question. Okay. There are a lot of hands up. Okay. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Uh, in your list, you know, about protection, it was a, first of all, it was a fantastic talk about it. Thanks for that. So the protection, the mask or protective equipment, uh, you did not uh, dwell on in much. Is it really going to be very effective if it is? Uh, so the, the current understanding is that the mask doesn't do too much to protect you if you don't have the disease. Yeah. It helps other people if you have the disease and you wear a mask. I see. The problems with the mask are more about how you use a mask. The ideal masks are these special masks called N95 or something, which right. have to be worn in a particular way. You should avoid and to be taken off in a particular way. The problem is that no, that, that sort of mask-associated hygiene yeah. is not often followed. Okay. So there was this nice example of someone who spoke of being in a flight recently, and everybody was very quiet. Yeah. They all wore masks. Yeah. They all filed in. They all sat in their seats. Everybody sort of not, not touching each other. <laughs> and the moment the food tray came, everybody took their masks. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the reproductive ratio you spoke about, is that a Wuhan number, or is it changing dynamically now that it's spreading? Again, sort of a very good question. That the number is based on the Wuhan data because that's the single largest number yeah. that we have for how many people were infected, how many people recovered, and a lot of the calculation of the reproductive number is how the disease has taken off. And the reproduction number, the reproductive ratio is a very specific idea. You need to have one, un, one infected person in a background of people who are completely susceptible. By the time the disease has proceeded a little bit, it's hard to find people who are uninfected in your vicinity. So that the original ground rules of defining that object doesn't hold anymore. Once you quarantine people, those ground rules don't hold anymore because this assumes that you can contact with equal probability anybody else who's susceptible. So that's the best guess, and that's where mathematical modeling comes in. And the mathematical models have indicated numbers anywhere between about 1.5 to about 4.5. And currently, the best guess is 2.3, 2.4. But that number may also change. So would it be a stray incident of yesterday in San Francisco? They've said that the case that they found has not traveled, has not moved. They don't understand how did it happen. So is that just stray in your, point, in your thinking? OK, so again, it will have to be my, my impression. I would find it unlikely that there was a completely novel case of someone 
in San Francisco who never had contact with the virus in any way before sort of spontaneously manifesting it on their own. I kind of suspect that there must have been some contact somewhere, some passenger infected coming back, some touch here, some, something that would have led to that. Sort of ab initio for it to start for completely different reasons in San Francisco as, op as opposed to some other part, as opposed to Wuhan, where it all originally started. That would be very unusual, and I would, I would not tend to believe it. So we have only space for one last question, and I'm sorry he has the mic, but Gautam is around, so please connect with him after the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, your lecture was an excellent, given as the wonderful information in a short span of time. Sir, see, you have mentioned that human and animal relationship. It was there since a long time. The fish markets was also there in the law firm since long time. Water, environment, and wet condition was also there. Now why this coronavirus has been appeared? That's the question number one. Small question under that. Is there any environmental deterioration as influenced for this virus? Or China is appears to be highly polluted country because of the development is concerned. Is there any relationship with that mutations takes place in the virus convert turned into the coronavirus? So I, I, I don't think pollution has anything to do with it, certainly. I and to sort of the, the first part of the question, um, this is certainly w social practice, let's say. For example, there are Chinese TV shows, like our reality shows, where people competitively eat. So you could, there was one show, 2016, where somebody ate a bat and somebody ate so, eats a, so this culture of eating exotic meat, this culture of, of that, of, 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 of uh, unusual games, unusual foods, etc., is something that seems to be a little more modern. Certainly, exotic animals have been part of Chinese traditional medicine, various types of Chinese products earlier as well. But in food, it sort of seems to have come, the, the larger exposure of the population to exotic food seems to have come more recently, is my understanding. And I think that might have, that might have been really the primary trigger for some of these, for the wet markets to become so prominent a source. So we'll have to close the questions, I think, because we are running out of time. But I just had one last question for you before we close. It. I saw this morning that the US has announced the testing of one retroviral drug. So can you just share something about what kinds of retrovirals seem to be effective? I know so far, everything they've tried seems to be ineffective. I think th there, is, there was some hope that some of the drugs used for AIDS treatment Remdesivir, is Remdesivir might be effective here. I have no information about what the current status of that is, but I think people are trying a lot of different things, trying to see if you can repurpose drugs that are used in other contexts for this particular. So if everyone is working very hard on this. Okay, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, Professor Menon is around for some time and we can have some more conversations over tea. Thank you, everyone. Bye.